Ready. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our issue briefing room here in the Media Village. It's, uh, it's here in the Media Village because we, we like to try to keep things edgy and as engaged with the public as possible. So you'll find some, uh, hopefully, a good selection of journalists in the room. You'll also um, be joined by several thousand uh, followers of our, um, our event on our website, weforum.org. And this is also being broadcast live on Facebook. So welcome to our audience watching us virtually here at the 47th Annual Meeting of the World Economic Forum. Issue briefings are quite unique beasts. They're 30 minutes, which isn't actually a lot of time to discuss something as broad as corruption, but we're going to do our best. In the middle of that, um, in the midst of it, and notwithstanding the time constraints, we encourage you to be as active as possible. So I encourage dissent, I encourage a little bit of scandal, um, a little bit of disagreement. Please get your, get your hands up in the air if you have any comments or questions to put to our panel. Um, I'm going to talk um, for no more time at all, hopefully, I'm going to introduce my panel. The, um, the description of this panel, with pariah and rogue states secrecy facilitating crime, corruption and tax evasion and money laundering, what sanctions should be imposed on those that violate international norms? So we're looking to try to get to the heart of this issue. In a year after a couple of notable events, one was a, a London conference sponsored by the then UK Prime Minister David Cameron, and of course, the Panama Papers, which were so um, effective and powerful at raising this issue back right up to the top of the agenda. First of all, I'd like to introduce my first speaker, and we'll have a short round of questions before we um, of, of questions with the panel here before we open it up. Professor Mark Peeth, Chairman of the Board of the Basel Institute on Governance, and, and explain a little bit from your perspective, your unique perspective on the significance of both those events. Yeah, let me start with um, David Cameron. It was actually quite impressive. He was spot on when he demanded that company registers, and he shocked his own constituency, that company registers should actually contain names of real people, the people who actually own a company. He said that and all the heads of overseas territories were standing around him and was somewhat awkward, had to react. The second point you're mentioning, in that year, we have seen Lux leaks, Swiss leaks, uh, um, Bahamas leaks, and uh, of course the Panama Papers. What do they tell us? Well, basically, something we always knew. This is how crooks of this world, and you know, it's organized criminals, kleptocrats, it's tax evaders of all kinds, tax defrauders, they um, stash away their money. The big issue for me is, why do we tolerate it? Why are we allowing this to happen? Because we could stop it easily. By the way, there's a report that we've piled up, looking this way, um, we'll talk about it later on, um, that, you, that uh, we invite you to take. Uh, in that report, we are trying to tell the world community how to get rid of the shadow economy. And you've seen more about those Panama Papers. Let's talk a little bit about that. So I imagine we've mm -hmm. scratched the surface with what we've read in the press. I can just give you a bit of an idea why I'm saying this so, so strongly. I've been in 25 years now working on economic and organized crime. I've seen literally hundreds, if not thousands, of cases where offshore companies and constructions have been used. One was this case, Oil for Food. I was with Paul Volcker in this committee. 2,000 companies had been paying bribes, most of them using offshore constructions. But this is just one small example, and you see this all over again. The only difference is, if you look at the Panama Papers, you are shocked because you see how real it becomes. Um, for me, uh, to see how a child prostitution ring in St. Petersburg uh, filters its money, and the people who actually help them know full well who the people are they're helping. I think that's dramatic and has no explanation. And as a, as a sorry, one quite final question. As a practitioner, were you still shocked by the scale and the severity of the papers that you saw? Yes, um, even though I've, be, I've seen hundreds or thousands of cases, they were more or less abstract. To give you an example, it's not uncommon that uh, four Russian or former um, Soviet di uh, directors of a, a state-owned company sell off the company at the moment of privatization. And now in the papers we find 600 millions that they have been receiving on a 
on such a company. That's kind of courant normal, if you want. What is the more shocking part is when it gets really, um, when people uh, help in these horrific um, organized criminal, help the, the, the organized criminals uh, to commit these horrific crimes. Professor Joseph Stiglitz from the School of International Public Affairs at, at Columbia. You're, a, you're an economist. You've devoted um, a lot of your time and, and energy towards this, this problem over other economic disciplines. What is your, your perspective on how we can do anything about it? And maybe quantifying the scale of a problem. Well, it's obviously very important uh, for, in, in a way, there, uh, you can put it in the context of one of the big issues being discussed uh, here in Davos this year is the backlash against globalization, uh, the darker side of globalization. And one of the things that we emphasize uh, in uh, our report on overcoming the shadow economy and, and that this kind of corruption uh, is that the uh, lack of transparency in global financial markets, the secrecy havens that uh, Panama Papers exposed but have been well known uh, in, in a way for a long time, it just reinforced what we already knew, uh, has meant that uh, there is a uh, global framework for both corruption and tax evasion and tax avoidance. And so, you know, the title of this uh, session is Corruption. And the fact that you can hide the ill-gotten gains so easily in these secrecy havens really uh, uh, provides um, uh, uh, incentives for people to engage in this activity because they can uh, in get the economic returns and then enjoy the benefits of those returns. If there were not these secrecy havens, the benefits from engaging in these kinds of illicit activities would be uh, much diminished. And have you done any, any, any work on the specific policy response to this? Yeah, so that's, that's really the, the main thrust of this report, uh, which grew out of work that Mark and I, uh, we were invited by Panama uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Panama Papers. Panama. Uh, not uh, surprisingly felt that its image had been tarnished and uh, that it needed to uh, do something to uh, rejuvenate its image. And they uh, asked Mark and uh, uh, me to, to uh, uh, work on a committee. Uh, I was co-chair of the committee uh, to uh, uh, put forward a set of recommendations that would show that they were committed to transparency. But at the very beginning of our work, uh, we, we said, well, uh, if we're going to have a committee on transparency, we uh, insist that our report be transparent. And that uh, our, report, our recommendations, no matter what they were, would be open. You can decide you can, uh, what you want to do with them, but we wanted to make sure that uh, there was transparency in a report on transparency. And uh, it's not a bad place to start. the government <laughs> thought that this was too big of a stretch and, uh, for them. And uh, so Mark and I had to resign, but having done a lot of work at that point, we said, well, it would be useful to write up a set of recommendations um, and uh, just to highlight two things uh, from it, uh, obviously there's some issues uh, that the global community has emphasized, the automatic exchange of information, but uh, one issue that's really important that Mark just mentioned was uh, beneficial ownership, disclosure, automatic access registries on, uh, public registries on beneficial ownership so you know who owns these uh, trusts, these corporations uh, through which all the secret uh, money goes. The second is that this has to be attacked globally because if there's any pocket of secrecy, those engaged in these ill-gotten behaviors will find those uh, secrecy uh, havens and so they'll find their way through. So this has to be, uh, if we're gonna make globalization work, we have to have a global commitment to root out these secrecy havens wherever they exist and uh, to have a global commitment to beneficial ownership. 
one of the countries that has not done its job is the United States. So it's not just offshore centers, it's onshore centers. Uh, a good point, and look, we'll come back to that one because you mentioned globalization, and, and we're in a year where globalization isn't particularly working all that well. So how are we going to get that started? On the opportunity cost of, uh, of not complying, I just happened to be watching the Panama foreign minister on CNBC this morning saying that that was uh, you know, bad for the nation's reputation. So they acknowledge it. So maybe let's maybe come back to that as well. But first of all, we've been very, very much focused on secrecy. Marjorie Krauss, you're the founder and executive chairman of, of APCO Worldwide. Uh, I'd love the business perspective on, on, on you know, what kind of commitment there is in, in the private sector to fighting corruption. It's not always easy. No, it's not always easy. And uh, we see it from two places. We see our own expansion as we go around the world and also through our client size. And Mark and I have been partners at the Global Agenda Council for the Forum on Anti-Corruption. One of the things, um, you know, is that from a business point of view, obviously there's a huge cost to uh, the business of trying to pick markets based on where there is uh, a chance of doing business in an ethical way and avoiding markets where there's going to be problems. So sometimes there's a whole disparity for the people who need services who can't get them because of the way in which their societies work, um, and that's really a, a detriment. I think for some of the companies, it's the cost of uh, compliance that goes from um, the nth degree because you have to enforce as much as you can. And we were discussing a lot of the countries that we're talking about have laws. It's not the laws, it's enforcing the <coughs> laws in a way that does root out corruption. But I think ultimately, uh, from what we have uh, discussed, the best way to, um, you know, this gets to the subject of the forum on leadership and ethics and values. And I think one reason there's so much outrage going on is that people feel there's this great disparity between uh, words and action. And this is certainly one area where that reigns true. And I think the companies that have the right value system, it starts at the top, that have zero tolerance, that know how they um, need to operate, are the companies that are, the, you know, show up on the most admired list as well. And so we've played particular emphasis on what could you do to encourage the, the good behavior uh, of the companies so that companies are doing the right thing and people start learning uh, those skills early on. And so uh, we did a study of millennials through the forum and uh, corruption was one of the biggest uh, indicators for them of, um, of an inhibitor on their future. And so uh, we tried to think of ways in which you could uh, begin teaching the importance of living in a, in a, a society free of corruption starting in the youngest grades so that by the time they got into business and they were working, they knew right from wrong intuitively and you didn't have to re rely just on compliance, that a lot of this was built into the system as a purposeful way of operating and of creating ethical behaviors. Um, and I think the biggest value to business of getting this right, um, aside from all the things we've been talking about, is also that um, today's young workers want to work for companies where they think the companies are uh, on the right path doing the right thing. And so the companies that uh, adopt these practices are the ones that are getting the best employees and that are proceeding in ways that are, um, you know, I think very purposeful. Just one follow-up question for me before we have questions. How high up on the boardroom agenda is this issue? Is it even on the boardroom agenda? Oh, I think it's on the boardroom agenda. I think um, mo <laughs> is it starts with risk and compliance because there are heat maps in all the boardrooms um, of where you do work um, and what countries um, are most at risk. And I think a lot of companies have in place um, uh, mandatory uh, requirements to um, have people go through training processes. And I know from work in certain markets that um, even with all the things in place that you do, and even with the best of intentions, it's still very hard to, um, to be able to oversee every single thing. And that's why the zero tolerance is really important because if people see an example of what happens when something goes wrong and it's definitive, then the next person is gonna think twice about, about doing that. But in some of these societies, Corruption has been around all the time, and if you're hiring local employees, sometimes they 
really don't see corruption the same way we all see it. And so it's important to uh, make sure that education's in place. Let's have a quick show of hands for who wants to ask questions. You have to um, compete with our global audience, so get your hands up quickly. I take um, this gentleman in the front row, whilst the rest of you gather your thoughts. Can you just remind us your Thank name you and where your you're from? Uh, Ali Koch from Turkey. Thank you for your thoughts. I want to ask you a question about education. Education in the workplace. I had my first ethical class when I was 27 in business school. Is there any work to bring this down to elementary school and not just only cor corruption, to be a decent person, fair person, ethical person? Why can't this be curriculum at the young age? We teach a lot of things to children, non-academic at young ages. Why can't this be one of them? agree with you and that's one of the things we we're looking at we even talked about can you create a character the way cartoon characters are created about somebody you know that children can look at who do the right thing and there are some things going on right now there's actually an integrity olympics going on online for younger people um, there are a number of things that we've been uh, working with business on and with some other organizations um, to try to push this at a younger age. It will not work if it's only done when you're 27. Professor Stiglitz, let's go back to your comments on, on, on global cooperation. We're an organization that prides itself on having a positive stand on the need for close cooperation between nations and stakeholder groups. But the landscape has changed since last year when the then Prime Minister David Cameron was, um, was heading a summit. He's no longer in power. We have a new generation of leaders, and we may have more. So it's getting more difficult to get global agreement on anything. Is corruption any different? I think corruption is one area where uh, it should be clear that it's in the benefit of all the countries, or almost all the countries, uh, all, all the, uh, you might say, uh, above the board countries, that they want to get uh, rid of it. I think there's been a big change in mindset since uh, I did some work on this when I was in the Clinton administration uh, uh, more than 20 years ago. And uh, we introduced, uh, I, I, I represented the United States in the beginning of the discussions on bribery. And one of the issues was a simple one, should bribes be tax deductible? And the United States p position was bribes should not be tax deductible. But there were several countries who argued <coughs> that bribes should be tax deductible. They were a legitimate business expense. Now, that view, some of you laughed and you said, well, that's absurd. And that represents the fact that we've gotten further. Uh, now, I think there is a broad consensus that, and OECD has taken a lot of initiative that, you know, corruption, bribes are a really bad, bad thing. And now we understand you know, not only that bribery is a bad thing, but that there have to be uh, b mechanisms for getting back the money that's being stolen and put into uh, uh, London and is being held there. We have to have transparency, uh, that it is having a major effect in development because all this money is leaving poor countries and going, being stolen, and money that could have gone for development, and, uh, and that it is uh, undermining the developed countries as well. So it's both a developed and a, a developing countries uh, problem. And we actually know, you know, and one of the things uh, we emphasize here, we actually know a lot about how to do a lot to combat it, to bring out more transparency. So in a sense, over the last 20 years, uh, as the agenda has gotten more refined, uh, we've kind come to better understand what are the loopholes, what are the vehicles through which that have facilitated uh, some of the bad practices. You know, I just wanted to tie on to that. Uh, for these countries where the money is leaving, it's also money not coming in because you go back to the boardroom and you have that discussion about investing in certain countries, and there are certain countries that are definitely avoided. Um, because of their practices. So it's, it's a double uh, impact on those countries. Uh, Mark, let's come back to you, but first yeah. of all, I want to bring in Ngozi Konjo Wela. Uh, pleasure to be on the panel with her only one hour ago talking about something completely different. So, <laughs> but you've got experience at international governance level and, of course, in Nigeria. I'd love to hear your question, please. Microphone coming. Uh, thank you very much, uh, you know, Levan. This. I 
just couldn't help uh, but follow. We've got such a great panel. And when Joe mentioned the I issue of returning the money, I think this is really critical. If you think about the fact that we had a study for the African continent um, uh, led by Tabo Mbeki at the behest of the finance ministers that showed that about $50 billion uh, is leaving the continent. Think of what this, how this compares to the aid that comes in. So, th but over time, in spite of all the work done, it's still not very easy to get the monies returned. So I really wanted to get your view in the work you're doing. What has to be done to crack this knot of getting the money back to the countries faster? And then my second question is, um, a lot of countries now find companies that they find have behaved in a corrupt fashion. Uh, the US fines very heavily, but it tends to keep all the money that it <laughs> obtains from the fines to itself. Mm -hmm. And when I was in government, we yeah. started to broach the subject that, look, if someone has taken, uh, you know, committed this act in, in, say, my country, and you find them $2 billion or something, could we also get a share of those <laughs> fines? Because we are the victim, that is the country of that act. Of course, we ought to do our homework, take the necessary steps to be blocking it. But how can we share in this? Because it's painful to see the developed countries co collecting huge fines, and then the countries from which the money has been taken getting nothing. Can you comment on that? And can we have a movement to make this up? Question is how to get the money back in the first place, and then how to actually have some of the returns go back to the rightful place. Mark, you had. I feel tempted up. to jump in, um, having had the honour of being called a friend of Star, the initiative that you spearheaded in the World Bank, stolen asset recovery. Um, and I think you're perfectly right to draw our attention. Um, the point where offshoreism and lack of transparency comes in is um, making it difficult to trace the money in the first place. All this offshoreism helps to hide, but there's something more. Take um, the uh, financial centers of the north. Take Switzerland, the place where I, where I originate from. Um, the difficulty there is that the laws are such that you can waste 10 years easily, and I think you've experienced that, to actually get to the money, even if the money is blocked, you still won't get it because you have to go through the rigmarole of all the um, legal steps. And I'm experiencing new cases where exactly the same game is being played. There are countries in a worse state. I mean, if you take Liechtenstein, you have not only one appeal, but you have about four appeals uh, in one row, which just means time, time consuming and loss. So I think you're perfectly right. There is a mix of technical difficulties and lack of political will that impede this uh, speedy asset recovery and is very closely interlinked with the offshoreism issue, the shadow economy. If you allow me one minute on the topic that you had raised, the um, issue, well, what, a, <laughs> what about um, business? They're in a, in a mess. They're in difficult markets. They're mostly small SMEs and they can't um, really, they're outnumbered there. What, what do they do? I think there are some positive ways of uh, going forward. One would be that you team up um, in something called collective action. It's something I think we'll be talking about in the second half of this week uh, quite a bit. How can you actually get your act together collectively and joining, joining forces with government? The only word I would like to mention there is, for instance, in, uh, um, uh, in Colombia, the, something called high-level reporting me mechanism has been created. A business ombudsman you can approach if you're being extorted. So that's, for me, something that is a new horizon. There is actually positive, there are positive. Can, can I just make one, one, one mark very briefly about the importance of transparency and changing the legal frameworks. In some countries, it's actually illegal to disclose information. 
And so where, where if somebody knows somebody has a deposit from a stolen money and he reports it, it's the person who discloses it that goes to jail, not the person who has done the illegal money. So one of the things we emphasize in, the, uh, in our report is, is the thorough changes in the legal structure that have to be done to make sure that transparency is facilitated and, and uh, 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 going back to this beneficial ownership uh, so you know who really put the money into the account. Uh, so that, and that clearly has to change. And I, I like what you said there. Uh, we sometimes get criticized here for, for not, you know, not <coughs> thinking about the livelihoods of small and medium-sized enterprises. So it's, it's a very good initiative. Very little amount of time, but we've got two people. Let's take both those questions. Uh, we have microphones on both sides of the room, and let's try to cover both of those questions off. I'm Monique Gullin, and I run the Thomson Reuters Foundation. And I'm very interested by the view of the panel on a radical move that the Prime Minister of India took uh, to fight corruption, which was to suppress the <coughs> bank notes and change them. What do you think about that? Demonetization. Great question. Really good question. The gentleman, so it's, it's you, sir. Thank you. So I'm Javier Arreola from Mexico, and I've lived in both Mexico and the US, so uh, I've seen the difference between a country that uh, raises more uh, or transparency than corruption, right? So the question is like the recent movements of Donald Trump might undermine uh, this transparency or or uh, enhance corruption somehow. Okay, so the the Trump effect and the the Modi effect. Which one do you want to tackle so first? Let, <laughs> let me say uh, on on the first question. I actually I believe very strongly that for countries like the United States, we could and should move to a digital currency and get rid of currency. Uh, and I have a paper, an NBR paper, uh, coming out on uh, using uh, digitalizing and electronic money so that you would have the ability to trace this kind of corruption. There are important issues, a private, uh, a privacy, and uh, issues of uh, cyber uh, security, uh, but it would have certainly very big advantages uh, uh, on on. And on, access uh, to accounts. Uh, access, and, and knowing, uh, and I think you could attack some of the uh, uh, cyber issues uh, because of the transparency. On just w uh, and where they've done it, it actually they've demonstrated that there's there's uh, less seepage uh, from in in the transfer of those accounts. But it's also likely to have a short term, at least, impact on the economy as well. So is it the most effective way? I think over the long term, the benefits will exceed the cost. And, and so, yes, there are transitional issues, and they may not have done those transitional issues ca carried out in the best possible way, but I think over the long term, uh, it's a, a move in the right direction because I think the, the, the corruption is very enervating in many of these uh, societies, very enervating. The other point is on Trump, just uh, if I recall correctly, uh, he actually uh, opposed the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act uh, because he said, you know, it's one of the dimensions in which you compete is by corruption. Uh, I think that represents exactly the kind of uh, stance that we should be against, a a as so many of his other uh, stances, and that, that uh, this is not the way to do business. Uh, and my experience uh, at the World Bank, and, you know, is businesses actually valued countries where there was strict enforcement of anti-corruption and value the Foreign Correct Practices Act because they could say, I'm sorry, um, we can't pay bribes because we'll go to jail. And <coughs> that made it easier for them to, to, to work in, in some environments that were actually more di uh, difficult. Business, business is where deals get done. Trump is a, is a deal maker. Do you think you can you can work with this new regime? <laughs> That's a little beyond the corruption. You're, rep you're representing. Discussion. You're representing your, your, I think, your community um, here. You know the um, the fact is we have a president that will be inaugurated on Friday, and he will oh. be president in the next four years, and we have to learn how to work with that. We we <laughs> should have our we should have our standards, and I totally I could not agree more about having. Um, not only rules, but having vigilance in place for any regime, whether it's our own or somebody else's. We can't go around the world and, and um, complain about this if at home we don't take care of it ourselves. 
Wonderful. We covered so much ground. But before we leave, I'm going to risk the wrath of uh, my Swiss overlords and go over time by asking one final question. I'm going to ask each of you for a prediction for the year ahead in this, you know, this is relatively fast-moving business. Bearing in mind Ken Rogoff's comments we've seen in the papers all week about everybody at Davos always gets things wrong. Um, <laughs> don't be put off by that. I'm going to ask you to make a prediction for what's going to happen in the year ahead. Maybe, Mark, we'll start with you. On corruption. On corruption, yes. yes. Well, I'm pretty optimistic. I've been this for 25 years now. I think we are making progress. It's just slow, and, it's, and we have to uh, keep um, fighting without dis despairing. Joseph. I, I agree. I, I think that this is an issue that it, it, the, the Panama Papers brought it out in open and, and made people realize it's so pervasive and so invidious that I think it cannot, cannot be ignored. And I think uh, there's enough, you might say, meat here for the media to chew over that uh, e even though there's a lot of uh, 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 things that to divert people's attention, I think this is going to be an important issue for the coming year. Marjorie. I, I think uh, we'll see progress on two things. Uh, one will be transparency, and the other will be technology. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching us live online. This session is now closed. Thank you.